Hello and welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily. I'm Aaron Porras. And I'm Natasha Kircha. Coming up in today's newscast, the election's results keep on pouring in. We break down the possible coalition outcomes. And we'll take a deep dive into the differences between Americans and Israelis when it comes to talking politics. Well, it's been a tense day and night here in Israel as the Israeli election results come in. Israel's Central Election Committee is still counting the votes, but as of this afternoon, an estimated 91% of the cast of ballots have been counted, right? And, and Israel is looking at a deadlock between the center left and the right wing blocks, mm -hmm. with Prime Minister Netanyahu's Likud party and the main opposition, Blue and White, receiving almost the same percentage of the vote. Likud and Blue and White are believed to have 31 and 32 seats respectively, with the joint Arab List party coming in third with an estimated 13 seats, and then the secular Israel Beitenu and ultra-Orthodox Shas parties tying in fourth place with nine seats each. And as of now, United Torah Judaism is believed to have secured eight seats, with former Justice Minister Ayelet Shaked's Yamina party securing seven. The historical left Labor party, which uh, merged with the Gesher party, has an estimated six seats, just like in the April elections. And the left-wing Democratic camp has five. This means that the contested far-right Otsma Yehudit party has failed to cross the threshold and is out of the picture. And given these results, it appears as though the Netanyahu-led right religious bloc has 55 seats and the Gantz-led center-left Arab bloc has 56, meaning neither have a majority. Mm -hmm. Now, many of you watching right now may feel a little lost following these election cycles, and we don't blame you. The parliamentary system in Israel can be very complex. Very, yeah. It's very understandable. So, uh, you know, no matter how long you've lived in Israel, actually, it can be hard to understand mm -hmm. how the elections actually work, and more importantly now, how the governing coalition is formed. But lucky for us, ILTV's Nittany Manson is here with a refresher to break it down. So, to start it off, the vote itself only determines how large the parties are. The higher percentage of the vote they get, the more seats out of the 120 in the parliament, or Knesset, they will receive. But once all the votes are tallied and the Knesset seats are all divided, the real fun begins, negotiating and forming a ruling coalition. Because it's at this point that the president of Israel, Reuven Rivlin, actually chooses one Knesset member from the party that made it in, and this person is chosen based on the likelihood that he or she can form a majority rule of at least 61 seats. In other words, that candidate will need to bring enough parties together to take up a majority of the Knesset, 61 out of the 120 seats. And usually this person is also the leader of the party which received the most seats, but as you might imagine, building a coalition and government takes time. In fact, the process can take weeks after the election concludes, and that's why the individual selected to build the coalition has up to 42 days to negotiate with the different parties who have their own demands. Then the proposed government is presented to the whole Knesset for a vote of confidence. And if the Knesset approves, you're looking at Israel's new prime minister and coalition. But if the Knesset shuts down the proposal, then the negotiation process will start again, either with a new candidate for prime minister, or it'll fall back to elections. And finally, once the coalition is approved of, it can begin its four-year term in power. But most governments have not actually served a full term, because coalitions can often prove unstable. And in case you were wondering, no party has ever won a majority of seats in the national election to be able to just lead the government on its own. The highest number of seats a party has ever won was 56. So what coalition options exist right now and who will be the kingmaker in this political standoff, Aaron? Yeah, exactly. At the <laughs> moment, neither Likud nor the Blue and White can form a coalition without the chair of the Israel Beitenu party, former Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman. Now, if Likud wants to form a coalition, they'll most likely turn to their natural partners, the right-wing Yamina party, the ultra-Orthodox Shas, and United Torah parties as well. The only problem is that doing so would only add up to 56 seats, which doesn't pass the 61-seat majority that's needed. Yeah, the Blue and White Party likewise is facing the same issue, even if they were to join forces with the Joint Arab List, which is highly unlikely, and then join with the left-wing Labour Gesher and Democratic camp parties, they would still only have a total of 55 seats, which also does not pass the 61-seat threshold. So this is where Lieberman's Israel Beitenu party comes into the picture. Both Likud and Blue and White depend on him to secure at least 61 seats. But Lieberman doesn't want to join either of the sides. He's been pushing for a unity government from the beginning, and that's Part of the reason that Israel's even facing these second elections. Exactly. Only now, Lieberman basically has double his power because his party has almost twice the amount of seats. 
that they had in the April elections, and with nine seats, he has the ability to call the shots. There is one final alternative that could leave Lieberman in the dust. Yeah, Blue and White and Likud could form a unity government, although both Netanyahu and Gantz have vowed that that won't happen throughout their campaign. So what does Lieberman want? Well... Well, his list of demands include an ultra-Orthodox military draft, public transportation and commerce on the Sabbath, and secular education for the Haredi community. And he says that he is not planning on speaking to any other party leaders until they meet his conditions. And now joining us for more elections analysis, we have Dr. Moldechai Kedal, Middle East expert from the Big Sadat Center and chairman of the Professors for a Strong Israel, Mark Schulman, columnist for Newsweek and editor of HistoryCentral.com, and Daniel Pomerantz, executive director of Honest Reporting. So our first question is a big one. Has Netanyahu lost? Nobody knows yet. And anyone who says they are is uh, spinning stories to you. Anything can happen at this point. At this point, no party is in a position to claim a majority, and the people we think of as kingmakers, Lieberman's party, can't really do anything that they want to. They're constrained by the math. And in a surprise, the uh, third largest party is uh, the Ayman Ode-led uh, Rishimai Mishutef at the Joint List, which is the Arabic party, which is notable that an Arab party in Israel holds so much clout in forming the new government. I would just answer that differently. Absolutely <laughs> lost. Not even a question. The reality is, before the, at the end of the last election, when he couldn't form a government without Lieberman, he had 60 votes, 60 members of the parliament, now he has 55. He's not anywhere as close to 61, which, which he said was his goal, which is one way, the only way that he was going to get immunity from prosecution. He did not get it. He has 55. His chances of being the next prime minister, I won't say at zero, there are some possibilities you can possibly imagine, but are very slim at this point. He will try, he will not go quietly into the night, but it's very hard to see how he ends up being remaining prime minister, especially with an indictment right around the corner. Dr. Kedar, you're well, I think too there, are, <laughs> there are actually two, two options. First, uh, that Netanyahu succeeds uh, to drag the Labour Party, uh, Peretz and uh, Orly Levy, uh, to the government by giving them whatever they like. But we've already heard reports that Peretz said no, there's no Well, chance. in Israel, when a politician says no, it means that he wants a higher price. No, but he won't do it this time well, because well, well, it's, well, it's well, not well, an well, addition. Well, well, this is one scenario, and this, it is feasible. It can happen. The second thing is that somebody who's very close to Netanyahu will tell him, hey, guy, you're losing it. Go out now when you're still close to the peak before you have to go out when you are being kicked out. So but here's and, my question. And take, take somebody like uh, Israel Katz, to replace you, and uh, you have no chance. Because the, I'll, I'll tell you why. In the Likud, in the Merkaz Likud, the center of the Likud, people start feeling that Netanyahu is more of a burden than as an asset. Until, let's say, a few months ago, people were overwhelmingly think that he is an asset more than a burden. But with the time, especially since he lost last elections and these elections, uh, he is viewed more and more as a burden. All right. What, and, I, what my question yeah. is, who in the Likud party has the gravitas and the charisma and the courage to actually step up Israel and take Katz. a little leadership Israel role? Katz, he has the killer instinct, which is totally needed. Unlike Saar, Saar doesn't have it. But Israel Katz has the personal ability to tell the people, stop arguing, stop arguing and start working. Look, the most reliable, the, 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 okay. the most reasonable scenario is Netanyahu negotiating an arrangement where he gets uh, out of his jam in terms of legal jam. He gets uh, either a pardon from Rivlin or just an agreement not to prosecute. In return, he gives up the prime ministership. That's what well, I would do if I was well, him at this point. It's the most logical thing. He's still, like he said, at the peak. He won't have to go through a trial and all the different possibilities. Most Israelis will all applaud. No one wants to see another prime minister on trial and no one wants to see another prime minister possibly go to jail. This would be the best solution for the country. But the question is, if there is somebody in the Likud who is courageous enough to go to Netanyahu and to tell him the truth. His and, lawyers should tell and him. If he his, can, his and if he can bring the party along with him. His lawyers can tell him very simply, you're going to lose this. Your best deal. I mean, it happens all the time with people who no, get so accused of so things. Let's, let's lawyers, it's not of politicians. No, but his problem now is not in, in, in the law field. His problem now is in the in politics. No, in the politics. No, he makes a, it. No, he has to personally back. make a deal. He makes a deal. He leaves office. The Likud goes into coalition with Gantz. Blue and White. Gantz becomes the prime minister. Katz becomes whatever he wants. 
and the, and we go on for another four years until we have the next election. All right, let's talk about most Lieberman likely. for a second. This will be the best solution uh, for the state. Lieberman, okay? Uh, who is he going to re recommend as prime minister in, in your eyes? Well, Lieberman has said that he would like to see a unity government, mm -hmm. and he's okay even if he's not in that government, which is a very statesmanlike thing to say. It's not something mm -hmm. you hear often in the Middle right, East, yeah. someone speaking like the, the, the adult in the room. Um, that might be possible, but right now we see that uh, blue and white has said that they can't sit with religious parties, and, uh, and the Likud right now seems to need religious parties, although maybe they wouldn't need them if they sat in a unity government. An interesting thing is if a unity government does form, then the head of the opposition becomes Eamon Ode, who is uh, the head of Israel's largest Arab party. Well, so, so I actually want to talk a little bit about the, about the Arab parties. First of all, uh, many, even within the Likud, are speculating that Netanyahu made a big campaign uh, faux pas or mistake in attacking the Arab parties uh, so early on as opposed to you know previous campaigns where he kind of did it the day of or, or even the day before Would you agree with that? You know, why mm. why do you think so many more? Uh, why do you think the Arab why turnout? Did so many, so it, it, it didn't change didn't you because those first of all Israelis are, are already used to this The Arabs are coming to the no, bar. This, this, time this doesn't make it, 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 it makes it, it make, it make a change outside here in Israel We know how to live with this but if I was an advisor of Netanyahu, I would tell him to do something very strange. Offer now, offer the joint party, joint list, to enter the government because Ahmad Tibi is a doctor. He is a gynecologist. Can't he be a minister of health? In the and, Kaholaban and party the, 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 the manager of Bank Lumi today is an Arab. Can't he be the minister of of finance, let them also be part of the burden of their responsibility. Why should Arab always sit outside? If Netanyahu did this, this would be a game changer. Because if they come in, in order to be part of the government of the state, Alan was Alan, as they should. But would okay, they actually that, sit with well, them? They wouldn't. There's not a chance they would sit. Let's be well, realistic here. I mean, let's no, let, 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 look. No, no, Balad look. will not. No, but, but there are others the, will. No, the others will sit with Kaholavan. They will not sit with Netanyahu at well, this point. Specific, they, 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 because of what know? he has done, I'm sorry. Yeah. I said all along, and everyone who can be, be, be a witness to me, I said all along the fact that Netanyahu was making a huge mistake by starting so early. Last time, when he said the Arabs are coming to the vote, he did it the day of the election. He did this two weeks beforehand. The Arabs came out to vote because of him, because of the incitement that he oh, did. I know a lot of Jews the who voted. The of, of voting was much less than, than, than before. What are you it talking about? It was like yeah, 70% was this time. It was way the up. The Arab vote was 70%. It was way, way up. It's unbelievable how much it went up. Yes, it went way up. But you know what? what the, did they vote for? Parties, what? The, the, they they voted for the joint. Not the only, but, but the joint. Many the, of them voted for, 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 for Israel, but, but, for Jewish but they they can't, uh, But you know, you, you have uh, Blue and White has already had talks with the Arab parties and said that they can't sit with them because the conditions the Arab parties would want from them are too strict. They, 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 they said that you wouldn't sit with them. Right, but what I'm saying is that if Blue and White at this point is saying that they can't sit with them and that may change, how much more... Could Lee could not be able for to say that? They haven't said right. that. Right now, they're having a meeting today or tomorrow. And look, the main things that the Arab parties want are stopping all the guns that are in their cities, taking care of crime. Number two, taking care of the whole issue of zoning. Infrastructure. Zoning, infrastructure, hospitals, education. The Palestinian issue, they want some sort of peace process. Sure. They don't really care what it is, they want to say right, there's a peace well, process. Well, they is a big well, word. Uh, well, we unfortunately well, have yeah. to wrap up. This is up. why Netanyahu can deliver. We unfortunately have to wrap we'll have to up see. right now. Um, but I guess the conclusion here is that we have no actual idea what is going to happen. Very interesting <laughs> arena. Yeah, yeah we're in an interesting arena. Very thank interesting. You. All right, thank you all so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. So what are Likud and Blue and White saying about all of this? Well, despite what appears to be a tough fight ahead in establishing a coalition, Blue and White leader Benny Gantz says his party is already experiencing great success. And Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu, for his part, is still very much intent on building the next government and standing at its helm. Speaking at the end of his campaign rally in uh, at the end of his campaign rally in Tel Aviv, Netanyahu vowed that he would go on serving the state of Israel and the people of Israel, and he also then blasted the possibility of having the anti-Zionist Arab parties in the ruling government, saying that Israel needs to go on with a strong, stable, and Zionist government that is a democratic nation state of the Jewish people. <laughs> I'm <laughs> not
But despite his optimism that he will continue as prime minister, the election results leave Netanyahu without enough seats to form a coalition alongside the right-wing parties alone, which therefore hints at his potential plan to go for a centrist unity government. On the other hand, though, Likud party activists and supporters at the rally chanted that we don't want unity into the early morning hours. Well, meanwhile, with an estimated 57 Knesset seats across the left-wing and Arab parties, Rival Benny Gantz likewise doesn't have a clear path to power, and he acknowledged as much during his own party's campaign rally overnight, saying that it's too early to declare a victory. That said, though, Gantz adds that Netanyahu did not succeed in his mission, while Blue and White has become a huge success. And moreover, the Blue and White Party is already preparing for coalition negotiations of their own, with Gantz adding later that he intends to talk to everyone while wishing the people of Israel a good unity government. המגעים הפוליטיים התחילו הלילה, אני כבר שוחחתי עם עמיתיי אמיר פרץ וניצן הורוביץ וקבענו להיפגש בימים הקרובים. אני מתכוון לשוחח בימים הקרובים גם עם אביגדור ליברמן ועם שותפים נוספים. אני מתכוון לדבר עם כולם. החל מהלילה נפעל להקמתה של ממשלת אחדות רחבה שתבטא את רצון העם ורוב החברה. Now, the joint list uh, coalition that unites four Arab parties is rejoicing because preliminary polls show that the party could get anywhere between 13 and 15 seats in the Knesset. Tuesday evening after polls closed, the joint list party raised up their arms in celebration and applauded their community for a high voter turnout. The biggest feat for this community was getting a large number of Arab Israelis to the polls and especially showing Prime Minister Netanyahu that his words, which Arab members of Knesset said were inciting, just helped get more Arab voters. And in the weeks leading up to the elections, Netanyahu had been warning Israelis to vote in order to suppress the Arab bloc. Arab members of parliament say that this tactic only made Arabs want to come out to vote even more, though. And turnout was high, and though we don't have precise numbers, the joint list campaign manager suggested that the turnout was above 60%. Netanyahu's Facebook page was actually temporarily blocked this past week when a post said Arabs, quote, want to destroy us all, women, children, and men. Now, for his part, Netanyahu says that message was not something that came from him, and he blamed it on a campaign staffer. Arab Knesset members say they see these early results as an indicator that the party will be able to influence policy in their favor. Members of the Palestinian Authority stress that whichever Israeli party that will come into power will play a major role in achieving peace. And moving on, coulda, shoulda, woulda is what we're hearing now from Otzma Yehudit's leader Itamar Ben Gvir regarding his party's failure to enter the Knesset. Because currently, it looks like in total, right-wing parties including Likud, Shas, United Torah, Judaism, and Yamina reached around 55 seats, which is just six seats shy of the 61 needed for a majority right-wing government. Exactly, and Ben Gvir argues actually that had more people turned out to vote for Otzma, his party could have filled that gap. Speaking to reporters, Ben Gvir says that they warned of the failure to form a right-wing government without Otsma over and over, but that unfortunately there were those who didn't listen. That said, though, with only 1.87% of the vote, Otsma would have needed literally twice the support it received just to enter the Knesset. So instead, members of the small party watched in silence last night as they saw preliminary polls offering them nothing. Jewish Power, the English name for this far-right-wing group, closely follows the word of the late Rabbi Kahana, who called for the deportation of Arabs and Druze citizens from Israel. Now, as for Yamina, getting enough votes for seats in parliament was easy. But with an hour or so uh, after the ballots, uh, Yamina leader Ayala Chaked sent a letter to the Knesset speaker saying that following the results, the party will be reverting back to its pre-elections factions. And those groups are the New Right, which include former Justice Minister Shaked and former Education Minister Naftali Bennett, the National Union, led by Betzalel Smotrich, and the Jewish Home Party, to be headed by Rafi Peretz. Shaked stated, however, that though she did, doesn't see this move as being right for the country, she has to follow through on promises she and Bennett made along the campaign trail. So while preliminary polls show that together these parties gain between six and eight seats, the number of seats for each of these three factions in the end will be divided up based on their individual final counts. So our newsroom is a mix of Americans, Latinos, and Israelis. And while people are people, some questions that are off the table in some parts of the world are perfectly acceptable in others. Yeah, absolutely. And here to talk the politics of all talking politics in the workplace is ILTV's correspondent, Shanna Fold. Shanna, what, what research are you doing on this? So I did do some research, but you know what I was thinking? Instead of explaining the research, let's show you the research. I asked a bunch of people if it was okay and comfortable to talk about politics in the workplace, and here's what some of the Israelis had to say. Sometimes in Israel, uh, 
strangers on the street or uh, etc. can ask you and it's a little bit embarrassing can be or, uh, or I mean uh, can develop to, into a debate or uh, something like that or an argument. There's no formality here. It's more um, with a lot of things uh, more freely and, uh, and we, it, we feel like maybe one big giant family and you feel like you can ask whatever for better or for worse. We talk about everything in Israel, so what, uh, who are you voting for is like it's nothing serious. That's what we do here. We invade, we invade other people's from privacy. So, you know, up until probably 10 or 20 years ago, we would even ask what your salary is, which is sacred for Americans. Not, it's a taboo in America. So we, we did inherit that from Americans. We, did, uh, we, we don't ask for, about salaries anymore. But as far as polit political views, yeah, we do that all the time. It's a Middle Eastern thing. We all feel very close to each other. We're a small place. We don't deal uh, very well with the polite and, uh, you know, ceremonies. Not one for ceremonies, huh? Definitely not for ceremonies. We don't deal I, with polite things. I feel like you must have had a lot of fun with this with this question, though, too. Well, I'll tell you why I had fun. Because when I got here and people were asking me immediately, who are you going to vote for? What are your political views? I was very taken aback. Sure. Because you mean when you got to ILTV? When I got to I, <laughs> when I got yes. to Israel from the United yeah. States, right. okay. it, it's really it's really not common in the U.S. to just yeah. outright ask people. I mean, you can get a sense of of who people are going to vote for. You might be able to prick and pry sure. and ask some questions. Yeah, um, but, yeah. But it's nerve wracking too, especially as an American. You're coming from that culture, and somebody you know, the Israelis, they just come out and ask you anything and everything. You know, right. it's it's almost. I mean, really, anything Honestly, and everything. Honestly, I have to say that I'm very much comfortable with it and I love that that freedom um, of ability to basically ask what you want. Sometimes it does cross a line when people are asking you about things like what your salary is. Which they definitely still ask. Rent, all how much by the, the way, time. they still ask they about still the salary. All the time. How but, much do you guys make? No, yeah. So so just a little bit of the research that I did find is in in many offices in the US it's actually illegal to make somebody uncomfortable by asking about their sure. um, about their voting preferences. And the only thing that you're protected by is talking about uh, the politics of work, like if there's something out of the usual or yeah. that's unlawful. All right, well, yeah, I mean, I understand that because, you know, there's anti-discrimination laws and there's there's that risk of, you know, retaliation or, or just people kind of changing their views about you. And here in Israel, you know, once you get into the job, like it's that same thing. They still can't ask you certain things about your religion, your politics, uh, in like a job interview or something like that. But after that, it's like it's, all bets are off. Right, exactly. Yeah. And I mean, I, it's, I was thinking about it because you can't say that talking politics is life or death at the end of the day. People can really fight over that stuff here and we hear it all the way. Earlier today in the offices right next to us, I heard people screaming, um, you know, regarding the outcome yeah. of today's elections. Um, but at the end of the day, I do think there is more of a sense of unity overall in terms of national national um, identity. identity here, yeah. which is perhaps yes. why talking politics is well, less we inflammatory. That we yeah. that that is, that's actually what all of the Israelis said when yeah. I asked them. They said, we're one big family. Yeah. We all talk to each other and argument and debate is welcome. All right. That's well, beautiful. That's, that's how beautiful. It should, I mean, how it needs to be. Yeah. I mean, you don't uh, have to our agree. Our viewers haven't heard the people scream. Listen, yeah, I know. <laughs> Next it can get ask, ugly, but, but it's ugly beautiful. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> We're all family, <laughs> but just don't vote for the wrong person. Ever. Okay. okay. <laughs> all right. Shanna, thanks, thank you. All right, let's take a look at the weather forecast. On that note, today we're seeing a mostly clear sky and a low of 76 or 24 degrees Celsius. And then tomorrow will be sunny with a rise in temperatures to high of 85 degrees Fahrenheit or 31 degrees Celsius. And that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.54 shekels to the American dollar. For more news from ILTV, please like ILTV on Facebook and follow us on Instagram. I'm Aaron Porras. And I'm Natasha Kirchuk. Thanks so much for watching.